so Lather uh, DJed there. Um, I met um, a lot of bartenders, a lot of people there, and then at the same time, I was interviewed and hired as a bar back and a lighting person at Maximum Security, which was then um, had just tra just um, converted from being 1270 on 1270 Boylston Street. In, it had been um, sold to the people who own Fritz, Joe McGowan and uh, Billy, I forget his last name, um, and a few other people. <clears throat> Actually, was Billy his brother? I'm not sure. Um, they um, bought the 1270, turned it into maximum security, which was de which was designed to have a much more male uh, targeted demographic. I mean, like the, it was all sort of prison themed, and although it had in the foyer when you came in, it had like this really femi kind of like sponge painted walls that were like black and fuchsia. So it was like you know sponge painting was like a big sort of interior design motif at the time. So it had a bit of a like a feminine kind of touch to it, but it had all these bars and, you know. Um, so that's really where I started to meet some of the other DJs that had even a larger influence on me. One of them being Terry Bowden, Terry Bowden um, who came from Provincetown and um, got a job there on Friday nights and Mark Tarbox was there on Saturday nights. And then there were occasional Sunday teas. Um, and a few other DJs. I think a, a DJ named Bruce who DJed at the Eagle for, the long, for a very long time. And I can't remember his last name, but he's somebody that might be worth remembering as far as um, if he's still around. I'm not even sure. Um, <clears throat> but I had just missed, or I had missed probably at least two waves of earlier DJs you know, in the 70s and 80s. By the time I started, I had not many of them were still working. Carol was still working at Chaps. Day and I was still at Chaps. Um, Freddie Bowes had left the 1270 after it became Maximum Security, and I don't know where he worked. He didn't work too much after that. Um, I want to say maybe he was at the Haymarket for a little while, which, is the, which also was a bar that didn't last too long. Oh, that might have actually closed before Maximum Security. Not entirely sure. Um, but so I had missed a lot of those DJs um, and only got to know them through Carol's record store. So around the, this whole period, I started going spending more time at Carol's record store, Vinyl Connection on Huntington Avenue, which is right near which where the Trinity Place condos are now, um, and where Chaps was right next door. So she would play records on Friday nights that only she had access to because she had just gotten them in the store that week. And they were imports. She dealt primarily in import vinyl. And so she would play things on Friday night, and then she'd have like 20 copies, 30 copies in the store on Saturday. And people would come flying into the store on Saturday to find out what it was that she had played or if they could get their hands on a copy, other DJs, fans, all that kind of stuff. So she kind of had a real smart sort of like uh, shrewd approach to like, you know, how she um, publicized some of her, her records. Um, and she was great. She was a great DJ. She was really, really, really one of my favorites. Um, uh, and she stopped DJing really, fairly unexpectedly due to a health issue in like 94, maybe 95. Um, so why was she one of your favorites? Why was she one of my favorites? Um, because she seemed to have, she seemed to know how to put disparate elements together in terms of like types of songs like she would you know play a lot of vocal high energy but then she would go into like a very deep house record as sort of a um, palate cleanser or something to go on to like the next bunch of things and I never really asked her I don't recall asking her if she planned her sets out um, that far in advance or if it was all completely improvised um, because that's sort of one of my own pet kind of um, obsessions about DJing is that like Mark Tarbox if I remember correctly at the 12 would bring um, just a certain number of records with him a set number of vinyl records with him practice the mixes they were arranged by beat per minute and um, I don't think he varied too much from that pre-planned set whereas Terry Bowden um, thought that you know you should just bring in what you had or as, as much of what you had and see where the night went I don't know which, where Carol fell in that whole spectrum exactly, and it's another reason why I would love, love, love to get her to talk to uh, the History Project. Um, but she, um, 
she just knew how to build energy and sustain it in a room. Um, and I think that, you know, things were a little different then too, though. I mean, you know, um, I was in my 20s, you know, I was sort of, um, I was doing a lot of drinking and doing some ecstasy and some, you know, various other things that kind of probably chemically enhanced a lot of those experiences in ways that um, it's hard to go back now and say, you know, analyze them more critically and say, would I have felt quite this way? Um, but that was true for most of the scene. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, drinking and there was ecstasy and there was, you know, uh, K and there was a lot of other stuff floating around at the time um, that I think lent itself to um, abandon or something.